Hi everybody, how's it going this week? Things are moving along, things are progressing, we're getting outside and dining out more often and getting actually into restaurants and that's about to happen up here on our wine bar as well. We'll be able to have limited amounts of you upstairs in about a week. We could have done it last week, we could have had some of you up, but uh, we didn't because the place was a total mess. We're not doing it this weekend because no fewer than three or four of us are getting their first or second shot. So I got mine this morning. Number two is coursing through my veins. That is, this shot is, and it's uh, um, going just fine so far. I'll let you know. But in case I'm not feeling all that great tomorrow, we thought with so many staff members getting the treatment, we'd better hold off on wine bar for one more weekend. That said, those tables out front are available. The weather's getting better and tomorrow should be beautiful. I'll get the menu as soon as I'm through with this video. I'll get Friday's Friday weekend uh, menu all composed in case the sun does come out today and you want to get out there. We do highly recommend that you reserve your table. There's only four or five of them out there and so since they're scarce, please give us a call, send me an email and we'll save you a table if there's one available. Got some good wines to tell you about today. And um, some of these things are uh, from vendors or from uh, producers that we've talked about before and others are brand new. But here is just a reminder that once again, Gran Bazan is back on our shelf. This is one of my favorite Albariños from the home of Albariño, which is Rias Baixas, Spain. A lot of green going on in this picture. We got this other bottle that's already open of the same stuff so I can taste it for you and a bright green cork there and the, the label here is obviously green it fits because this is green Spain this is the area where it does actually rain on the plain in Spain and you've got lots of lush vegetation you've got to be careful with mildew here you got to be a little more cautious and they train the vines accordingly to keep them off of the wet ground a little bit higher up pergola system so that's how an Alberino vine in Galicia is often um, trellised. So Gran Basan does it that way. What they do really well is make one of the best Alberinos I drink every year. And I'm going to prove it to you <laughs> as if this is proof. But I could be saying anything, but I am not making this up, I promise. There it is. This is classic. Pinot Grigio, um, oh, I should say Pinot Grigio, because if you took like somehow Pinot Grigio, maybe Viognier um, and Sauvignon Blanc and got them all together, that kind of sums up as this other grape, Albarino. The experience is lean, lithe, it's got beautiful fruit, but it's also got a tiny bit of herbaceousness and what I often call rained on foliage, as if it rained at night and you're going out to do some gardening the next morning and there's still water in the air, on the lawn, on the uh, the lemon tree over there. This could be a, le a rained on lemon tree right here. Man, it smells good. It smells green, a wonderful refreshing greenness, which of course, what's a green fruit that we use? It would be limes, right? So lime peel is often a descriptor for for great Albarino, and this is great. Gran Basan is back. Well, I'll let you know it's on the shelf. We used it in a Zoom event last night. Somebody who never had Albarino before, I was asking everybody out there in Zoom land, like, what do you think of this wine? And somebody said, not negatively or positively, it's really acidic. Well, it's supposed to be. This is high acid white wine. This is not buttery oaky Chardonnay. It's vibrant. You do it with uh, seafood of any kind, but especially shellfish, and it'll rock. Do it with shrimp. Shrimp, like, off the grill, hmm, bam. Hmm. Hmm. You know, is as acidic as it is, it's also got a richness to it. It's got a nice mouth, a nice texture to it. So it's not just like thin and laser beam. It's got that, but it's also got some nice richness to it. Really delicious wine. Well, what's the other green thing we have up here on stage right now? This is to announce, drum roll please, that we finally, after months of just kind of holding off, we couldn't wait for tomatoes, of course, to get ripe on your backyard vines yet, but we had to bring back the burrata for which we have become so well known. Our burrata comes from Puglia, Italy. It's not domestic, it's not from California, even though we're starting to make good ones now. We love the stuff that comes from the source. It's flown over, so it's fresh. It doesn't have to bob around on a boat waiting to get a port spot out there in the San Francisco Bay. That would have been a disaster if this burrata had been out there for weeks. Instead, it comes over here really fast 
and we hopefully sell it really fast. This is to announce that burrata is back in the cheese cooler. Check it out. Just to tell you, Don and Kathy are doing a bang up job of finding you new and interesting cheeses, and we hope you'll support that idea. Just ask them, either one, like what's in lately? What have you done with your cheese selecting lately? And they'll be eager to tell you about new things. And sometimes like the Gran San Alvarino, a cheese we were carrying that is now back. Welcome back, Burrata. It's good to see you. Let's tell you about a few more wines that have just arrived that I am very excited about. I'm going to say a reluctant farewell to this Albarino to the bucket with you so that I can put this up in front of you. We've just recently brought in three different bottlings of Baletto. Baletto is a producer up in the Russian River Valley. They own all of their land. Everything they make is a state grown and they have a lot of land because before they were growing Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and other grape varieties, they were growing produce. They were in fact, I think Northern California's most significant uh, produce uh, provider. And um, somebody uh, finally gave him the advice, you know, you can make a little bit more money on a bottle of Pinot Noir than you can on a, a, a stock of broccoli. So they switched gears several years ago and became Pinot Noir and Chardonnay grape farmers and winemakers. So they sell a lot of fruit to other people. They keep about 10% for their own Boleto label. We've just brought in a sparkling wine from them that's wonderful. A, um, a wonderful Pinot Noir that's super honest. I love Pinot when it's not like screwed up and messed around with. Like, don't take it into the winery and push all these buttons. Like, let's keep it pure and right. And their Pinot does it really well for $29.99. Check it out. Well, here's Pinot Noir in the form of Rosé, Dry Rosé. The new 2020 Dry Rosés are arriving. And even the ones from Europe are finally getting here too. Get, getting out of the... Uh, bobbing around on the bay mode where some of them had a they were stuck out there for weeks some of these boats did you know that well they finally got a spot at the port and those foreign rosés are starting to land but in the meantime let's tell you one about one that's much more local to us baletto and i want to say that i think california's best foot forward with rosé winemaking is the pinot noir grape it's not in fact grenache and senso the the south of france style that we attempt to emulate we often come up with a good one, but the success rate is higher when we try to make great Pinot Noir Rosé. Great dry pink wine here. It's happened again. Yeah. You know, when you first open it and take your first sniff, it's got that reductive quality that we were talking about several videos ago when we were referring to a wine for our wine club that smells kind of, if I may, poopy. But reduction is actually can be a good thing. It protects the wine in a way. As long as it blows out, you want it to blow out. And this one is already changing. It's coming up now. Here is the fruit. It's It's got a nice um, uh, cherry. And let's see what else is going on. There's an earthiness to it too. <sighs> Pinot Noir, you know, when it's a red wine, is one of the most beautiful sniffing wines there. You almost forget to sip it because it sniffs so well. And some of that carries over to the rosé. It's coming in. I think I want to warm this one up. Get my hands all over the glass. They say that's inappropriate. It's not in my office. If I want a glut and wine to speak a little more loudly, I warm it up. Fastest way to do that, body heat. Well, wow. here it comes. Man, it is fragrant. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. The reason why I like Pinot Noir Rosé from California is especially texture. No other rosé in California, or from anywhere, really can match the silkiness of a great Pinot Noir Rosé. This is doing it. I like this wine not just for its beautiful nose, its nice tart flavors, its dry, good earthiness, but for how the wine feels. It's sensuous. Mm. Really good. All right. Farewell, Valetto. That's heading to the fridge. Here's a label that you might recognize, or at least you will recognize the name, but we have yet to carry a monastrel from this great producer out in Lodi called Bokish. Bokish has many, many acres, perhaps over a thousand acres of fruit, sells most of his fruit, keeps some to make under his own label. This guy did a lot of uh, wine training in Eastern Spain and Catalonia 
and nearly everything he grows is uh, Spanish varietals. So he's got Albarino out there and makes a fantastic one. He's got Garnache, and because of his Spanish leanings, uh, he calls it Garnacha, of course. And what else? He's got that Tempranillo, of course. We've done Tempranillo in our wine club and you've loved it. And what has just arrived and gone onto the shelf? The last two and a half cases of Bokish Monastrell. Do you remember what Monastrell is? Monastrell is the same as Mobet. So if you were having it in France, you'd be drinking Mobed. If you're having it in Spain, you're probably drinking Monastrell. Okay? This is mild mannered, beautiful red. It doesn't stick out anywhere. I think I was talking about that with respect to a Merlot last week. This does not taste like Merlot, but it behaves like the Merlot we were describing in that it is, it's full, fairly full bodied, but it's so easy and mild and it's got a nice kind of smoky quality to it too. Monastrel, Horma Bed, whatever you want to call it, it's in, only in the form of like two and a half cases. It's on the shelf right now. Get in on this bokish, fairly affordable. I think you wine club members with your 10% discount, get it for right around $20. It's delicious. Now or never. While we are on that subject, I think we ought to talk about this wine. We just told you that Monastrel is the Spanish name for Movedra. Well, there's another Spanish name for Movedra that's not really used in Spain anymore. However, for some reason, some of the old, old California farmers, uh, some of the original California uh, planters of grapevines, decided to call Movedra Mataro. It's an old Spanish name for the grape. And so when you are buying from a farmer or from a very, very old vineyard in, in um, California, where Mavedra still exists, like here, this vineyard planted in the 1890s. This vineyard is now over 125 years old, planted on its own roots up in Oakley. This is when you're transacting with a, the, the, the farmer growing these grapes, and he is automatically calling it not Monastrel, not Mavedra, but Mataro. This is Mataro, grown in Oakley, very, very old vines, it is freaking delicious. It does cost more than the Monastrel we just described, but it's got more substance in the mouth. It's probably got more durability. It's halfway to Bandol in quality. Not quite the same. I think it's easier to drink, less grumpy than a Bandol from France, made of Mavedra, would be. Um, but man, it's dimensional. It's really, really good. And I've already opened a bottle, so I won't open this, open this one in front of you. Otherwise, I'll never make any money on the rest of what I'm selling. But this is Good, good stuff. The really cool thing is who is making this wine. And it's a great name for this, this bottling and uh, his other wines in the same line, Once and Future, refers to the fact that this is made by a guy named Joel Peterson. Way back when, decades ago, Joel Peter was the founder of and proprietor of a winery that used to be little called Ravenswood. Ravenswood Winery made thoughtful wine, small production stuff, delicious, and specialized in Zinfandel. And then, of course, Joel cashed in, sold the brand to a big conglomerate, and um, really the quality went to hell. It became nothing but a brand. That brand has been sold once again, I think perhaps to Gallo, and may come to a, an end because they are just kind of like, they bought a whole collection of brands and are reserving the right to just like, to remove the competition and eliminate. So there may be no more Ravenswood. Doesn't matter, Ravenswood had become something totally unlike what Ravenswood was originally. Imagine Joel Peterson like watching all that happen to his precious name and wanting to come back into wine. Well, he's doing it now. He's making small production again. I think 93 points from Venice and um, boy, it's 100 points from me. This is fantastic old vine Mataro. It's a great story. Nice to know that Joel Peterson is still at it many, many decades after he initiated Ravenswood. Once in future, good juice. Let's stay on this subject for a second. The subject being the fact that what might be inspiring Joel to get back into the business is that his son, Morgan Twain Peterson, is kicking butt with the Bedrock label. Have you seen Bedrock before? Perhaps you've seen this beautiful label on our shelves, but you've never seen it, at least on our shelves, representing a white wine. We've carried Zinfandel, we've carried red blends from Morgan Twain Peterson, son of Joel Peterson of Once and Future. And um, all of this stuff tends to come from old vines, small production again. 
This is Sauvignon Blanc. This is not inexpensive $10 Sauvignon Blanc. I think we're in the mid 20s. It's worth it. It's a big bump up in quality and thoughtfulness. It's done a bit like a Dagano Puy Fume, and about three of you out there know what I'm talking about. But Puy Fume, the wine region across the Loire River from Sancerre, had at one time, actually the brand remains, but the proprietor passed away a while back in a tragic accident. Um, but Dagano was the guy who thought Sauvignon Blanc from here is fantastic, and it can probably still express its wonderful minerality. That's what every French person would, a uh, winemaker would want to respect and maintain in the wine. But Dagano realized I can still show that, that sense of place, that minerality, but ramp things up by giving it barrel. Not to make it oaky, but the barrels are usually neutral. And so this is kind of a, a copy or a, um, a facsimile or an honoring of the Dagano style of Puy Fume with some barrel treatment. Again, not to make it woody, but because barrels are porous and stainless steel tanks are not, the transaction of air through the barrel to this wine is it rounding. I call it oxidative rounding. So this wine has a little more into the mouth, not as rich and buttery as a Chardonnay, but it's got more body than a super lean, laser beam, clean, zingy Sauvignon Blanc style, okay? Get in on this bedrock, it's really lovely. We brought in two cases, they may be the only two cases we're gonna get, is what we're hearing. Um, because all of a sudden, other people other than this wine taster and wine buyer have heard about it and are grabbing it, so bedrock. The last wine I wanna talk about represents a, a little thank you story I'd like to quickly tell. This is Trinquero. It is one of the Cabernets that Trinquero makes up in the Napa Valley called Mario's. It recently got a 95 point rating from Decanter Magazine and I'm tasting it right now. Here it is. Look at the darkness. Beautiful wine. We don't talk about Cabernet all that often and yet we sell a lot of Cabernet so I should represent it more often, shouldn't I? I want to say a thank you to a particular person out there who just gave us a wonderful, like, March, the month of March, making order. To help fill his cellar, we are going to take, and my little Honda Element, many, many, many cases of wonderful Cabernet. And all week long, I've been tasting and choosing on his behalf. Like, what would he like? What would he like? Oh, that's the one. Tasted this. This is one of them. This is going out there. And because he wants, like, six bottles of this and 12 bottles of... <laughs> Cases would be nice, but sixes and twelves are the normal amount he's going to get. This wine had a nice price on two six packs, but our wholesale improved automatically if we were to commit to five six packs. So I thought, you know, more people than just he are going to like this wine. Let's put some of this on the shelf. Tell the rest of you about it. Man, what a beautiful nose. 95 points from Decanter, and now that I'm tasting it, I can agree that what they said, something about pencil lead and sweet smoke, hmm. lots of black fruit, cassis, richness, almost chocolatey kind of a uh, expectation here. Hmm. I'm swallowing that, sorry. <laughs> this wine has beautiful flow in the mouth. It's rich. But it's not hard. It doesn't have any hard edges. It's got wonderful, it just seamlessly runs along the tongue, fills the mouth, and then says a fond and long farewell of finish. Wonderful toffee finish. Black, okay, almost burnt toffee in that end ending. So thanks to a customer who gave us a fantastic order. The rest of you wonderful customers out there will be able to access this wine as well because I bought not two six packs, but five. And if you buy us out, I'll get five more. What the hell? Let's see what happens with Trinquero Mario's Cabernet. So that's about it. You know, just uh, want to remind you, you know, if the uh, if you are dying to have a seat out front and want to do uh, wine by the glass or a bottle out there, you better just like give us a call and we'll reserve you a table. The other last thing to tell you is Mary Denham finally got in here and refilled that freezer. It was down to three items. You have been wonderfully supportive with uh, her project called Blooms. And these are items that you go home and bake yourself. They are scones, they're cookies. Um, I'm not even sure what she brought this time, but I know she did the scones again because we were lobbying for that, remember? Sometimes dad knows what he's talking about. At any rate, the scones are back, Blooms End products are like in abundance once again downstairs. 
And one more time, don't forget the burrata. The burrata's here. Find some decent tomatoes somewhere, will you? And get the uh, insulata caprese thing going. It's great to kind of see you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Have a terrific weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you at the wine steward soon.